Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me in my shop so I'm not all alone with this great, big, huge radio. Well, uh, when I purchased this radio in uh, 1976, it came with a manual. Thank God, because if you don't have a manual, like a service manual to a radio like this, things aren't going to go well after a while. And here it is. When I received the manual, it was just a sheaf of papers in a loose folder. But look what I did. I punched holes and stuck them in this binder. So this is the manual that I've had the whole time I've had the radio. And thank God for this thing. Uh, really. Because I've had to resurrect this radio a number of times over the years. Uh, really, I think every time due to capacitor failure. Some of the photocopies not done very well on here. There's notes and stuff, very detailed descriptions of each stage, how they work, why, theory, all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic in here. Troubleshooting guides, everything you can think of. Right in the front, I'm going to show you something kind of interesting. This is a military receiver. Right? Different versions of it. Just hang on here. And get, here we are. Sighting. Good. Bad. Bad. Good. Hilltop, flat terrain, or near large water surface. I'm near a large water surface, I guess, in my house here. Bad. Near high tension wires. No, that's a bridge. High tension wires. Steel bridges. Or in valleys or depressions. Not exactly, oh, so it looks like railroad tracks there. And exactly why they're showing these two guys chatting out here, I don't know. But it really is a military manual, isn't it? How to take it out of the box, and on and on and on it goes. Really, really fantastic. One of the, the uh, one of the, uh, it's, a, it's a different, I was just going to tell you something, but actually it's a different radio. <laughs> I've got two things in my head at once. So there we go. I'm going to put this manual away now. And there's, there's quite a few manuals that were issued. There's like an Air Force manual, and an Army manual, and then there's uh, uh, sub manuals. There's also a number of versions of this radio. My radio is the JX. The JX radio. Serial number 2621. So it's, it's radio number 2000, 2600. Uh, there's inter lots of information on the internet about this radio. Uh, I'm not the only one who loves this radio. And uh, um, all kinds of interesting stuff can be dug up on the internet about it. So Now here's what I did. By the way, this is the schematic that I used for so many years. Get an idea? <laughs> What's going on here? Th this is what I had to rely on with this thing. It's just pieces of paper photocopied and taped together and this this has a lot of problems <laughs> with the uh, there are lines which match up perfectly with the uh, folds and creases in here and disappear. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I had. Here's what I got now though. I'm going to take a little bit more time and look at this. This is my chart from uh, that I developed in the last video. And afterwards, what I did was uh, identified some of the critical things that I thought should be investigated further, circled them, and then I investigated them further. What I did was I, I looked at that schematic, I looked in the manual, I tried to reason out what could be causing these anomalous readings that I was getting here. Okay, so one of them quite quickly was I probably didn't have the front panel controls set exactly right for the particular test being done instructions over here I didn't really follow them turns out two of them this one down here where uh, it says 500 K and I measured zero is simply the volume control and the volume control was set to zero so the reading here would be zero too or close to it so that's all that was that's not a problem this one this one uh, on this sheet is zero is written there but the same information from which this sheet was developed in, you know in the modern times shows this as a not marked. Not marked, or not measured rather, not measured means the pin is open and it could be used for other terminal type problem or uh, situations. So 
who's to say for sure just don't measure it so that's that one goes out so these two are gone uh, now a couple more here this one so here very oddly on pin number one I measured well not I, I, it's not what I measured it's what it says it says it should be 380 there 380 ohms so when I looked at the schematic and just add up the resistances that are going to be measured when you measure in that pin it comes out much closer to 125,000 ohms and the actual reading here 118,000 so I think this is a correct reading and this number 380 is incorrect that's what I think I don't think there's a problem there so we come over here this one I measured 500,000 ohms when it should be 26 I didn't have the band set in the right place set the band in the right place you get the right reading here. now if you can look you'll see there are six fairly heavy blue arrows standing out one two three four five 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 what happened to six? Oh right because I started I started then because <laughs> I started counting from two that makes sense right two three four five six because I was started writing a list here of what I need to do and the first thing was check the settings on the front of the radio if I if I care to 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 uh, investigate these further probably don't so then from here two three four five six are the where do you see the dark arrows pointing to issues that are still outstanding so and then I've taken a guess as to what the issue might be so we look at number two here Th you're supposed to find 390 ohms I found zero so that sounds like a shorted bypass capacitor on the cathode resistor shorted bypass three and four I have no idea why would this is supposed to read almost 900 K and it's reading 1 K how does that come about I don't know and this one um, it's supposedly supposed to be infinite and I'm reading 30 K here so I don't know what's going on there maybe it's just I just didn't didn't do the test properly or something I don't know number five where it should read 46 K and instead it's infinity or open circuit my guess is open resistor and then the last one number six here which is this reading that I couldn't get a stable reading on it uh, don't really know for sure what happened here so maybe I'll repeat that just as it is but maybe it's a cold solder joint under here that's doing that pushing on the, the socket pin and kind of moving the joint around a little bit so we're going to go after these. Uh, we're going to start with number two, shorted bypass on uh, tube number seven. Shorted bypass on tube number seven. So from here, we got to find this on the schematic. I'm not going to. Well, I don't know if I want to go through this. Tube seven. Let's go through it tube number seven eight six seven pin number pin number seven shows zero ohms so we take a look at tube number seven I say this wrong pin number seven tube seven pin seven I wonder. here's seven seven so seven goes straight to the ground seven should should read a zero you should read a zero on pin seven on tube seven tube seven pin seven right to ground and that's what I read so whoever wrote this sheet up must have made a mistake on this too because they had the 380 out here incorrectly and a 390 here and we can do one more check on that this is what I did last night I'm a little surprised so there's you know this information has been, been rehashed by somebody I got the original in here let's just go for the original charts
Here they are, here they are, here they are. Two charts. Not so far back in the manual. So again, the confusing thing is which radio do you have? <laughs> There's all these charts. And I very cleverly wrote my radio on the right chart. So pin 7 of tube 7. Where's tube V6, V8, V7. Tube 7, 455 KCIF gate. Pin 7. Shows 390. In the same tube, pin 1 shows 380. So we know where you got those numbers now. Let's, let's just look at another version of this. 390, 980. And this version of the radio, it's 0 and 390. No, it's zero volts. These, these are, every one of these is showing some kind of resistance in here. This is seven, pin one, 115,000. Pin seven, zero. My radio. My radio. So here we, we would expect to read 0 on pin 7 and 115K on pin 1. Pin 1, we're reading 118K and 0. So, so th this chart is probably for a different, actually a different version of this radio. It's, it's probably what's really going on. So I best, so, so that stuff's okay. So my, I was wrong. It's not a uh, shorted bypass capacitor. That's a bit of a stretch because I've replaced all those, all those kinds of capacitors. Place all the paper capacitors in here, so so this is okay. Okay. Next one of interest would be number three. Why am I reading one thousand ohms? So it's V fourteen pin two. V so well, let's double check that on the chart here. V fourteen. V14 pin number two, 812 K, just under a million ohms. 812, and on here, 870. So yeah, this is definitely coming from a different radio. 812, and I but I measured 1 K. That's quite hard to explain easily. 1 K, eh? and uh, this is. B14. B14. B16, 12, V14 right here. V14 pin number two. V14 pin number two. There it is. Wow. I'm not going to get the correct reading. For a moment there, this thing showed exactly the right number 800 something. So I, I did the test wrong somehow. How, how did I do that? Did I maybe I maybe it was a thousand and I read it. It's a million and I read it as a thousand. Or did I go to the next pin? A zero. Or the, uh, the first one again? I don't know. Don't know how I did that. But that's gone. So you know that's close close enough. Why, why is it wandering around a bit? I don't know. So this is okay. We're knocking them off one by one. Next one is V V15. 
maybe there's absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, the radio does work. No, I don't think there's absolutely nothing wrong. I think there's definitely problems of sorts. So this next one is uh, supposed to be infinite. And I measured 30K, something like that. This is V15. Let's just take a look here. It's awkward looking at this on a piece of paper. It's just as awkward looking at it on the computer. Because there's power in paper that doesn't exist in a computer. And I'm going to demonstrate the power as soon as I turn this right side up. The power, there's a couple powers to paper. First of all, every time you open a sheet of paper with a dry, drawing on it, everything is in the same place it was in last time. Right? It's there. If I open it, it's there. I know where it is already. I know where it is even like this. Open your computer screen on a drawing too big for the computer, and this thing could be anywhere on the screen. But on a piece of paper, it's always there. That's a big advantage that people don't realize. Number two, the automatic zoom on pieces of paper. Paper how? Automatic zoom. Let me demonstrate. Okay, this is a long zoom, and I will now zoom in. I will zoom out. Look at that. Now that's tricky on a, on, a, uh, on a computer screen. Yes, you can zoom in, but when you zoom in, the outer parts of the diagram disappear off your screen. They're still on here. Yeah. So don't knock paper. Now here's the problem with paper. It's a big long piece of paper. <laughs> okay, we're after tube 15 after doing my speech speech on paper. Yeah, like like I so I worked in an engineering department. Everything was done on drafting boards with pencils when I started, and when I finished, everything was done on computers, of course. And that transition was an eye opener because the, uh, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. A lot of things about the old methods made a lot of sense, and the new methods weren't up to snuff in some respects. In some respects. I'm telling you what you already know. Okay. I'm sort of going back into my memories of days gone by. I'm looking for 15. Here's 15. My photocopy looks a little questionable in this area. Now, what are we doing? So we're looking at pin 2 on V15. Why would it be infinity? Pin 2. So this is a two-part tube. Pin the other part of the tube down here. Pin 2 is the plate. Pin plate comes up, goes right through a variable resistor here, this could be knocked to zero, meter adjust. Then it goes through this resistor, photocopies poor, but it looks like 10K. And then things get really complicated from there. So it goes over to the output of the audio transformer. Not, yeah, the two outside, the two outside pieces with the jumper in here. So basically, you throw the switch, on the panel, the meter becomes an audio meter, getting its audio signal from here, rectifying it in this in this tube. Like go of the switch, it's a spring-loaded switch, the meter's always showing you the signal strength. And that's coming on these wires. Maybe something to do with this, I'm not sure. So in the normal state, the switch is uh, not as shown. This is shown in the audio position for some reason. Yeah, RF and audio. But it's normally in the RF, RF position. I wonder why they did that. So normally the switch would be switched up. And then you're looking at, let me trace one back here, this wire, this wire, and I'm getting into big trouble with my circuit photocopy because of this. This photocopy line is right on top of vertical lines on this schematic, so I kind of get lost at this point. I have to look, have to look at a better schematic. But logically, it says infinity, and it's a plate. How would you ever get infinity on a plate? The 
because this switch is, is open and not in the audio position. That's why, that's why you should get infinity when you do that test. And then if you throw the little switch, I'll show you the switch. Here's the switch, right here. Meter RFAF. It's a spring-loaded switch. So in this position, we should see infinity. Now somehow I got a reading other than infinity. What, I just made a mistake. Pin two of V fifty. <coughs> excuse me. Did I say fifteen? Yeah, fifteen. Okay, two fifteen. 14, 15, 6 AL5. 6 AL5s are troublemakers, eh? Let me just get this to show up a little bit better. No, I can't. Okay, I'll just tell you what it says. <laughs> 2, right? 15, pin 2, pin 2, pin 2 again. supposed to be infinity and we're getting why well, make that out to be what 30,000 ohms and that's what I wrote down here too uh, let's throw that switch hmm hmm just trying other oh look at that so that, that is uh, pin number uh, 765, pin number 5, any others do that? Pin 5, this is pin 2, pin 1, Pin 1, we're supposed to measure 94, we get 98. There's the 98 there. Pin 2 is supposed to be infinity, and we get 30K. Pin 5, pin 5 was the, uh, one that went like that. The one that went like that, pin, pin 5 is, uh, so it should show infinity right now, and, and it does. And it doesn't say anything about throwing the switch and measuring it. So, so the, that's a switch effect, I don't know. So what's going on with pin two? Something's going on with pin two. Something is going on with pin two. So I'm gonna stop and get a better circuit diagram, and get it up on the screen, and we'll look a little closer at what's going on with pin two. Well, it turns out one of these uh, manuals that I've got, I found on the internet, has an excellent schematic here, a one-pager, a one-screener, and uh, as far as I know, this is the entire radio here. Um, and someone has carefully redrawn it, so that means there could be errors in this too. Uh, so, we're interested in this tube here, V15, a pin 7. What we're asking is, no, pin two, pin two. Looks like this tube is doing two entirely different jobs. That's a two part tube. So we're looking at this part here. Pin two, we follow it down here. There it's going through the meter adjust. And R70, I don't know the value of that offhand. Be something, you know, this could be set to zero, but this can't be set to zero. And it comes in here, gets to the outside of the uh, audio transformer, if you like. So the resistance measurement goes through all these windings. Down here, come onto this wire. Oh, maybe if I have a uh, speaker hooked up. Um, well, what I've got hooked up here is 50,000 ohm impedance hooked on these output terminals here. So that's another resistance path, if you like. And that's actually skipping around the outside here. Expect 600 ohms, and uh, I've got 50,000 there anyway. 
let's carry on and come down here. Yeah, because it's audio and the switch is disconnected here. Just make this a little bit bigger. So the, the meter, the meter, oh yeah, so we want to follow the resistance down from the pin, right? So we're following it through here, through these resistors. So I don't know how you get, you get infinity because this is open. I didn't get infinity because I have a because this is hooked up. Is that all it is? That's all it is, maybe. Okay, let's go back and check and see if that's what's really going on here. Okay, so the problem is I have a connection in the back of the radio, an audio connection. So we go on pin two and we get the 30,000. I disconnect the audio. Well, that didn't do anything, did it? I'll disconnect it completely here. Well, that didn't change it. Oh, that did. How did that? Well, okay, that's a little tough one to explain. Um, this radio is currently... Jim, that radio is plugged right in the wall while you're doing this. This is probably not a good idea at all. Let me pull it out. I forgot to read the, uh, well, well, we'll get to that. Let me just set this aside here. Set it below. Now what do we got? Infinity. And if I attach this lead here, we still get infinity. So I don't really want to try to explain exactly <laughs> what we were reading there. Um, but now the radio is in the proper state for doing the test and it's giving the proper result. So so this one is gone. They're all disappearing. What's left? So what's left is number five. This is pin six this is tube sixteen, pin number six. Should see forty six K. I'm getting open. Let's repeat the measurement then. So uh oh gotta put, put the tube back in here. So can you can you picture army guys dragging dragging this radio around with some kind of power supply for it? I don't know what that would be. Big batteries maybe. I don't know. How do you drive this on a battery? I don't know. Up to the top of a mountain, like uh, I didn't show you. Did I? Did I, show you this? I think I missed the, the the most interesting picture in here. Let's just look through it again. I gotta find it. I'll show this to you. Maybe it's not this manual. Operating under unusual conditions. Wait a minute. I thought there was a whole section here on how to operate this in sand, operating under operation under usual. Operation in Arctic climates. Sub-zero temperatures, climactic conditions associated, blah, 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 blah. Handle equipment carefully, keep it warm and dry. If it's not heated, and is not provided with the means to insulate it, keep the radio receiver turned on. So if necessary, heating is provided by the vacuum tube elements. Heated, if the radio is inside a heated enclosure, located so it's in no danger of a cold draft striking the vacuum tubes through the top side or rear vents. If the enclosure is so constructed that this precaution is impossible, place a blanket or some barrier between the source of the draft and the radio receiver. The headset has rubber earpieces. When operating in open air with headsets, do not have the rubber earpieces. Wear a knitted woolen cap over the earphones. Frequently, when the headsets without rubber earpieces are worn, the edges of the ears freeze without the operator being conscious of this condition. Never let rubber ear caps, never flex rubber ear caps since this action may render them useless. If water gets into the headset receivers or if moisture condenses within them, it may freeze and impede the action 
of the diaphragm. When the equipment has been exposed to cold and is brought into a warm room, it will sweat until it reaches room temperature. Well, it'll condense water onto it. It doesn't sweat. Operation in tropical climates. When operating in a tropical climate, radio equipment may be installed in tents, huts, or when necessary, in underground dugouts. Like, can you picture this? In an underground, like a hole in the ground. And two guys in there with headphones on, trying to listen to the Vietnamese. Literally. Literally. That's what happened with this radio. Um, when equipment is installed below ground and when it's set up in a swampy area, moisture conditions are more acute than normal in the tropics. Ventilation is usually very poor and the high relative humidity causes condensation of moisture on the equipment whenever the temperature of the equipment becomes lower than the ambient air. To minimize this condition, place a lighted electric light bulb under the equipment. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're trying to hide from the enemy and you're sticking light bulbs under your radio? Doesn't that kind of counter operation in desert climates. Conditions similar to those encountered in tropical climates often prevail in desert areas. Use the same measures to ensure proper operation of the equipment. The main problem that arises with equipment operation in desert areas is a large amount of sand or dust or dirt entering the moving parts of the radio. The ideal preventative precaution is to house the equipment in a dustproof shelter since such a building is seldom available. However, we would require air condition and would require air conditioning. The next best precaution is to make the building in which the equipment is located as dustproof as possible with available materials. Hang wet sacking over the windows and doors. Cover the inside walls with heavy paper and secure the side walls of the tents with sand to prevent their flapping in the wind. Never tie power cords, signal cords, or other wiring connections to either the inside or the outside of tents. Desert areas are subject to sudden wind squalls which may jerk the connections loose or break the lines. Keep the equipment as free from dust as possible. Make frequent preventative maintenance checks. Pay particular attention to lubrication. Excessive dust, dirt, and sand that comes into contact with the oil and the grease and the grit will ruin the equipment. <laughs> okay, that's that. And you kick out of it, you know. I, you know, the more you know about these these old guys, the more you can appreciate, you know, their history. And as I say, this particular one probably lived its life in one location, way up north in Canada, on the uh, distant early warning line, trying to detect the Russian bombers coming to bomb America. And I, I bet you that line is still up there, and there's something going on up there. I, although, actually, I believe what's happened is the antennas are up there. But and maybe the radios, but the people are now down south. They don't have to go up and uh, sit in those places way up, way up there. And it's just another thought. The, the, I, I watched a, a documentary on this. The level of effort to establish the distant early warning line was enormous. Flying planes up into nowhere, way up in northern Canada building buildings, power supply, all that stuff. A huge undertaking. But it seems like today, if you ask the government to do a huge undertaking, like maybe do something about the virus, they don't seem to be able to undertake it to the same scale and the same urgency and the same degree. And I was watching another thing about Britain the other day, a, a, a documentary about uh, the British uh, efforts to um, control the submarine uh, attacks that were coming from the uh, Germans during the Second World War. And the level of effort is unbelievable. Uh, like at one point, and just as a casual statement in this doc documentation, they said, so they built 33 ships. Uh, that was just a small moment in the process of building up to try to control the uh, German attacks and stuff like that. Well, we just go build 33 ships. In the end, they didn't use those ships. They got an even better idea and did something else, but just like like that. And somehow it seems like today, while we're being attacked by this virus, the governments just can't can't take this uh, uh, very very aggressive approach to things. What was the difference between the Second World War or a war and everyday life? Well, what is the difference exactly? When it comes to economics, I don't know. Okay, enough of that. Enough of that. Oh boy, did I ever get off on track there? Well, I apologize for wandering off, but hey, <laughs> it's just my wife and I here in our home. I'm going crazy. Now, 
back to what we were going to do. What were we going to do? I was going to put the uh, the cover on this tube before I forget. The cover is gone. Forget about that. We were going to try to sort out this one. Right. Oh yeah, boy, did I ever get off track there? Gotta watch myself. V16, pin 6. V16, pin 6. V16. That's a 12 AU7. Now here's a, a 12 volt tube doing in a 6.3 volt radio. As you can feed the two, you can feed the uh, 12 volt heater with two 6 volt shots. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, a tap in the heater here. So it's really two 6 volt heaters in series. Actually, it's probably, no, I won't. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's two 6 volt heaters in each side. And you can put them in series and make it a 12 volt tube that way. Right, it's two tubes in one. Oh my gosh, I've become so talkative all of a sudden. i got to stop that. This is pin number six. And what we think we're going to see is open circuit. Let's see if that's really true. Pin number six. Six. Well, wow. it's claiming 46K. V16, V16. Pin... Six. Oh, I think I'm in pin five. I think I'm in pin five right now. Pin six. It's definitely pin six. <laughs> my finger moved over. Pin six. I'm looking down at my sheet in case you're wondering what I'm doing here. Should see 46k, but getting infinity. That's right. That's one I think. And this is a uh, nine-pin tube. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the story. There's definitely something going on there. So this one we'll have to go a little further on. And the last one is number six. Number six was the 145K, and I got a we just got weird readings from it. And this is on tube V12, tube 12. Here's tube 12. Pin number six. Six. That's pin six. That just what, is, what happened there? Is that my meter doing that? I got a lot of wonky readings from this pin. circuit. It's supposed to be 145k. Oh! Don't move. Now that's reading one mega ohm. And it's really hard for you to see that. Yeah. Get a little better somehow. I want to like that. It's a little bit better. When, and see that? It went from it went from where it was to where it is now. I guess that's true of everything in life. Well, there it goes again. So yeah, so something wonky here old solder joint or something of that sort going on. Read it very tight in the corner of the radio here. Okay, now I think we got to uh, tip this guy up on its backside here. Get access to what's underneath it. That's a big, big thing. A lot of uh, momentum in it when you get it up and uh, crash it into something, it'll smash whatever you crash it into. So I'm going to flip it up on its back, on its, on its arse basically, and 
I don't know, are these going to fit? Yeah, it's going to fit. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Lost that tube for sure. Okay, I wouldn't want you to miss the disaster here. So I'm going to pick it up by the front and lift it up this way. It's going to crash into my light. I might bang the microphone here with it. So I'm going to drag it forward. And then up. Oh, boy. go that we're concerned about get down in here down in that dark dark corner that's correct right it is it's right down in there where I replaced a couple capacitors right down there So if I worked in here and I made some kind of error, then I'm just going to be looking at my error. Um, the original part, of course, is long gone. So way, way down in there. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. So we want to get a look right in here. So I'm going to switch to the uh, close-up camera. Whoa, whoa, where is it? There it is. Switch over to the close-up camera and we'll tuck it in there and see what we can see. solder joint of the capacitor doesn't look very good to the wire it's soldered to. Looks like the solder didn't really flow. But, uh, and another one up in there doesn't look terribly good. It's a scary beast, eh? So I see another I made a connection to this resistor. It doesn't look very good either. That looks, these all look terrible. These all look terrible. It's probably because of the awkward situation. Maybe I was working in bad lighting at that time. Um, so the problem here, though, we need, we need to look at it from the point of view of the problem. The problem is I'm supposed to read 145K on certain pin and I get various readings when I take the reading on the pin now. And let's see if I can figure out which, which pin it is. I think I can fix the camera right in here. Uh, bear with me a sec while I uh, adjust the focus on that camera. Don't go anywhere camera. Of course I really don't know the history of this radio. I just there, that's a little better. I'll get a little better lighting onto it. There, let the sun shine in. Okay. So the pin in question is pin number six. There's pin numbering there. And would it be that pin six is that one right there? That's clearly to the ground. Now it's supposed to be 145k on this. Oh, wait a minute. 
145k um, that's a BFO injection uh, y y you know what I, I think I may have, may have jumped ahead here unnecessarily BFO injection so it could be that I have a control set such a way that's giving the reading we're getting Gone berserk. So I want to repeat that test and fiddle with the, the BFO injection control. That's that's this. Then I then I fiddle with this. Then I not fiddle with this. What is that? Yeah, there's a history of this radio, but most of the history is with me. I don't know what all this uh, wire is here. Yeah, I'll leave it. Some. Um. And six. Pull the tube out again. Gotta get into pin six. Pin six. So let me get a probe in there. Oh, I can't see anything. Still can't. Still can't. Okay, pin six. So we're counting seven six. This would be pin six. push a pin I should push something in there and clip on it. oh look look at that can you see what I see this resistor huh. literally broken right off though well, that's that's the problem and it was related to wiggling the pin when they'd taken the test boy oh boy I ever lucky I spotted that. So, so we're gonna just tack this guy back in and we're done. It's almost like it's been cut. So just tack him back in. Okay, there. Hey, hey I'm fixing something. <laughs> yeah, let's get that. And you might say, well, why don't you just replace the resistor? Well, because uh, there's probably no reason to do that. That's that's why. Um, maybe I could take a reading on it if I'm really lucky. Let's just see if I can while we're waiting for that. Soldering iron. Now, what, what is the value of it? It looks like a vertigo. Um, brown, black, yellow. Oh, that's a, what, 10K? Brown, black, yellow. 10K resistor. Let's see. You know, some doesn't feel right about the other end of this resistor either. Are going to be able to get a reading on it? Probably not. Maybe it's 100K. Yellow. I think it's 100K, I think is what it really is. 125 is what we're getting on that. It's probably a 100K resistor. Now. So the reason it's exceptionally loose, even though it's soldered to a terminal, is the terminal is a socket terminal on the tube socket, and it's loose. So that's why this seems so flippy floppy. But it looks to me like I just gotta tack it back there. That's all I gotta do. Let's do it. 
and that, that's an original resistor. Uh, it's not something I ever changed. We should consider what this is doing too. I mean, how does the radio work with this? The way it was. Don't usually use a pencil, but. Okay, now, 100, 145, maybe it's a 145 ohm resistor. Let's try reading it again. This time we'll do the proper, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look for the 145, 1000 ohms. into pin six again. Oh, no, that's pin two, pin six. Look at that. Hey, ring the bell and everything. Uh oh, got my phone in here. Very sorry about that. You may have been listening to telephone interference from time to time. Apologize for that. Still going up though. Still wandering around. I... No, it's not bad. Okay, that's good enough. That would be good enough. So, have I solved them all now? So, that was number six, cold joint. I thought it was. Turned out to be a resistor. Uh, I guess you could say a really cold joint. <laughs> kind of got that one right. Uh, Shorted bypass turned out to be false measurement, I believe. Number five. No, this is the one we're doing right now. Oh my god, if I mix things up. Did we, did, did we deal with that? Uh, V16. I can't remember. I'm crying out loud. Okay, V16. Double checking that. V16 and forty-six where we get infinity. On six on sixteen. I think I'm just repeating something I just did, but that's how it's going to be. 7896. It's supposed to be 46, and it's open. Open circuit. Yeah. So we still got this one to deal with. Okay, so that's V16 right next door. In six, so it's right, right down in here. Where? Down in here, same place almost. Let's see if I'll be as lucky this time as I was last time. So the socket. Oh my gosh! Look what I've done. <laughs> not, not a bad thing, but one, two three resistors serialized through here, three in series. What, did I not have the right size resistors? <laughs> yes, I wasn't doing this on camera because I hadn't started. You, this is just, I did this work just, be, the capacitors you see, just before I started doing YouTube videos. Should probably cut all that out and put in one resistor. I'd have to find that on the schematic and verify it. So the problem here is we're supposed to read 46, but we get nothing. And that's on pin number 6. So if we take this tube and we count the pins, oh my gosh, I get more 
way out. I'm going to switch to the other camera too. right there. That would be seven. And then that's eight. I can see the number on it. Eight, seven, six, five, and four joined together. Some soldering down here. It's pretty solid. Nothing, I didn't do any soldering on this. So we should look for a, a bad component. Wait a minute. So I did do some soldering because there's the uh, this this wire. You can just see a tidbit of it. It's actually a new capacitor. It goes to a new capacitor. So what else is on here? If there's only a capacitor, there must must be another connect. If it's only a capacitor, there's it's going to be open circuit. Let's look from another angle here. A little too close, I think. Let me just move it away. Uh, what are we seeing there? Let me let me fool with the focus. Maybe we can see better. So that's the chain of three resistors that I serialized together, and then uh, down down behind them. Resistor appears to have a the resistor with the blue band on it appears to have a hole in it. It's probably just a visual thing. And then the actual whoops pin number six. I don't think it's any of those. I think it's down here. Freaked out by what looks like corrosion in here. Um, if I uh, put the probe in pin number six and wiggle it, and maybe we can identify for sure which is six underneath here. So I will do that. I will endeavor to do that. So one, nine, eight, seven, six. So six, six, you know what? I don't think we're looking at six here. I think six is underneath this capacitor. I think we can see it more like this. Okay, wiggle. And moving, uh, it is moving a little bit. And a big blob of solder. Again, bad looking solder. Okay, the reason this looks bad to me is the, uh, the older wires don't look like they took the solder very well. Again, so here I'm reading infinity when I should get 46k. There's a resistor down there. Is that the 46k? No, there's a red there's a red band on it, so that's that's not 46. That's a thousand. I think that's a thousand. Is there another one? Down under here. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I don't. It certainly is a lousy solder job there.
So it looks like five and six are joined. Or six and seven. Six and seven are joined. Now we look at this on the schematic for a minute. Pin six and seven. Okay, I'm gonna go, I'll find this on the uh, schematic. Okay, so what we're looking for is um, uh, tube number stupid number 16 tube 16 15 12 13 20 hey where the 16 where'd you go I just met off in my own head here uh, 16 16. Two number V8. Hey, come on. There is no tube 16. There we are. Oh, it's 12A7. They hit it. They hit it way up here. Cathode follower. They can rarely tell you what the IF output. So, so this, I believe, is, is isolating away the IF stages from this output. So you can plug stuff in here. You won't affect the radio. So I think that's what that is. Audio. So pin, so we were looking at, um, I don't know, which, which pin was it? Pin, pin six. Pin six. Pin six. Hey, pin six not on here. So what is pin six on a 12E7? Oh, good question, my phone says. You've hit it. Pin 6 on a 12A7. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to look at my tube manual quickly here. 12, 12A7. Twelve, 12A7. Pin number 6. What's well, a plate? What's happening? What's happening? That's six. That's got to be a six. Okay, so if we now, according to the chart, we're supposed to find 46k between this point and ground. So R80, unknown amount. So I'm looking for the fastest way to get to ground. Oh boy, oh boy. Everything is capacitorized. See, like you go up this line, there's a resistor, but it doesn't go anywhere. The capacitor blocking it. So any you know, DC resistance reading, this is infinitely open here. Oh my god, it's just getting too complicated. There's just too much. To, uh, hey, look at this. this. Look at that. That goes right to ground. Two resistors in series. Why would they even do that? 72, 73. So that all adds up to 46. R72, R73, and R80. Uh, R72. So somewhere, somewhere we can find a parts list. somewhere. I have a parts list in my paper manual. No parts list here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, bingo. We've got a parts list now. Can anybody remember the part? The part, the part I was interested in. <laughs> I sure don't remember it. it. Was here. It was uh, 80, 72, and 73. 80, 72, and 73. R. 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 80. 72, 73. 
7,500, 10,000. So it's 17,000, these two. 20 watt, 20 watt resistors? 20, I'll say it again. 20 watt resistors? I gotta find these. Oh my gosh. That's a whopper. And then it was 83, wasn't it? 80, 80, it was 80. Where's 80? So 80 probably appears somewhere else in this list. There's 80. 2200, so it's not very much. Oh my god, 5 watt, 10, where are we? Look at this, a 10 watt resistor. 22, 220 watt resistors. Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize such a thing was in there. So, so but this doesn't add to 40, whatever, this doesn't add to 40. This adds to, uh, you know, 17, 20 at the most. Where do you get 46 from? These appear to be direct, uh, direct. Uh, starting here, come to 2200. So there's nothing else that would like parallel it down. Uh, I don't know how this works. Uh, just admitting what's obvious, Joe. Relay, relay. Relay, relay. On this circuit? Must just be the supply. Send receive switch. Well, there it is, right there. Send receive, right there. Yeah, let me just separate this. Uh, nothing to do with what I'm curious about. So I don't understand um, what has gone wrong here. That now could it could it be that crazy chain of resistors really is really part of the picture here? And I did something stupid back then. Uh, let's find these two big whopping resistors. Um, they must be easy to spot in this radio. Let's go look for them. I'll need a close-up camera for this. There's one. There's a big one. But... Way up here, when the circuit's down there, It's a little like a five five watt. A twenty watt resistor is a big honking thing. Be mounted on the side panel. I don't see anything. Well, I think that may remain a mystery for a little while. Where 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 these two? Maybe they put them over by the power supply here somewhere. see some of the gearing inside this uh, radio. This is the band changing gearing and then here's the tuning. I guess the tuning gears are up above. You can't really see them. Yeah. There's a big heavy uh, flywheel. Gives it that wonderful feeling uh, in your hand when you're tuning this radio. So where did we get here? So we got, uh, we got a problem with the uh, and missing 48 on pin 6. Let me make the measurement from underneath, if I can. Let's see if that is in any way different. Of course it shouldn't be. The pin, I think it is. Right.
infinity on that pin. Have I not got the right pin yet? So uh, let me count them directly here. So that would be one, two, three, four, five. This will be six. Really? That's really pin six. Nothing going on on the meter, eh? There's a capacitor there on pin six. Count them the other way. One, two, three, four. This looks like for sure this is pin six here. Um, because you've got to be sure of things at times when you're doing this. Sometimes you don't need to be sure. Other times you need to be absolutely sure. Try and read this basically right through the socket. Pin number six. Counting. I think I got six. There's seven, eight, and nine are left. Then six. We're looking for a zero to show up on the meter. I think it's this one. Okay, I don't think it's this one. And I don't think it's this. Or, or this. I think it's this. So that's the pin. There's nothing on it. There's no wire on it. I gotta get in there with a close-up camera because uh, there should be, there should be like there's supposed to be a resistor coming out. Pin number six. So pin number six is dead center there with the shiny shiny leads going to this capacitor. Now what I'm really looking for is there another wire on there that I couldn't see that's actually hidden from view. Sure doesn't look like it, does it? So there's a there's some wait a minute, maybe maybe there is something coming to it there. Pretty clear. That there's nothing there. Well, how can that be? Pin six. Wish I could read the pin number on that. I, I, I can't imagine I've got it wrong now. Pin six. Well, if that's six, five and four are shorted together. So let's look at the schematic and see if that adds up. So if this is six, man, I I've been in here too long, I can tell already. Um, so I can't remember what the two, it was the, it was the 12 AU7, right, right, pin six, right here. So it sh there should be a capacitor to ground, which there is, but there's supposed to be a resistor connection. Uh, it has to be right on the terminal here because that's where the capacitor is. Uh, the purpose of this really is to drive this IF output, and I'm even thinking of popping this tube out, but I guess I can't because it drives the audio. But at the same time, I'm thinking about taking all the audio tubes out of this radio 
powering it, uh, drawing the audio off uh, earlier, that to cut down the number of tubes running in the radio and cut down the load on the uh, power supply, literally. Well, there's no reason why I need all these tubes in the audio section. Getting back to the deal here, though. So why do we even care if this isn't working? I, I wouldn't even be aware of it. Certainly, you know what we could do here? We could leave this, carry on. One of the next stages that's coming is the voltage checks, very similar to the resistance checks. And in doing that, I'll get to this tube, and then we can find out if there's really plate voltage here or not, or am I just gone, if I just gone crazy? Because this just can't disappear. It would be laying there, broken off to the side or something. And so, you, so to make this resistor connection to this wire, this resistor would have to go to another terminal, like a spare terminal or terminal strip or something. Nothing going there. Yeah, we'd have to leave it as a mystery, open mystery. Um, somewhat not so critical because it's driving a feature in the radio I'm not currently making any use of. That's it. I've been through all these now. So ultimately I've made one change to the radio and that's reconnecting the resistor here on tube number um, tube number 12. So what does tube number 12 do? Let's look at that too. Let's look at it here on the schematic uh, number 12. Buffer. the uh, so that's interesting so here's the oscillator for the beat frequency oscillator beat oscillator they call it this isn't working and this tubes involved obviously a buffer tube a BFO injection control and this is where the resistor was popped off resistor was popped off of which terminal? Uh, just one, just looking in the back of the radio. To, uh, okay, so it's terminal 6. Resistor popped off terminal 6. So if we go here, we see 6. This resistor had popped off right here. Well, that's a weird note. What's that? Uh, I don't know what that is. R100. So, so this guy popped off. You soldered back on. The screen's back in place. How much you want to bet this oscillator system works now? And I've restored the uh, BFO. Hey, let's operate the radio and find out. And then that'll be it for today. Um, should I should put the tubes back in it? That'll, that'll certainly have an impact. Six one eight nine six BA six. Well, this this is the twelve AU because all the pins on the bottom. In you go. In. this radio up on its end here. What we want to do is verify the uh, yeah it's a you know I, every time I flip this up and down it is a bit of a risk so I'm gonna leave it flipped up like this. Take you up. Switch is off. This time I'll make sure I make a note of how much power this thing draws. I think we're all set. And so the objective is to find out if the BFO is BFOing. That's this control here. 
These radios, by the way, they have a common problem. In this control, has some physical little physical stops, so like that. But what people think is it's an on-off switch, and they push it harder, and they can break these pins. Once you break the pins, this control is free to turn all the way around. This control is actually mechanically turning a coil inside a coil. And if you turn it too far, it will rip the coil off. It's wires inside. This is, and this is true of this radio. I had to fix this, this problem when I first got this radio. This, this, the problem existed here. So I guess, you know, the big muscular uh, male uh, soldiers uh, up in their listening post are just too hard on the equipment. <laughs> Broke it off. Ready to start. Any reason I should be hesitant? Do I, I don't have the audio hooked up. Let's hook up the audio. Oh my god, the audio is down under here. But actually, here it is here. Right here. So I, I can sneak it out of here. Which I will do. Pretty sure that's what this is. We'll find out if it isn't. So I plug the radio in, so that the cord is live up to the radio. And I'm fiddling around with this, and look what's right here. Right here is the external outlet for additional equipment. I think there's 120 volts sitting on there right now. May or may not be switched. Let's find out if I almost killed myself. I mean, you'd want to know if you almost killed yourself, wouldn't you? Hundred and nineteen volts available. Come on down from the high perch. Looks like nothing. It's really not very big wires coming to it. Okay, we'll turn on the radio. You see the lights in my shop dim like that. It's a big inrush current. Now we'll see if that voltage is here. Still not there. This means it's for something else, maybe, uh, because it's fairly light wires. This doesn't look like a power wire situation there. It sure looks like an outlet. I just don't remember. I'm not going to flip the radio up to look at it. Oh, 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 i got to put the headphones on. What are you hearing? Nothing. Volumes are all down here. Headphones on. Okay, volumes up. Big hum. Hum, dingy dog. Again, that hum could be because of how I've done this in my shop. Especially this connection. Maybe. The question is, ignoring the hum, Is there any BFO? So we got to tune something in. What band are we on here? Oh, something's. What's become so microphonic? Wow. Okay, it wasn't that way before. Hum and microphonic. We're going downhill. these. I 
gotta stick my finger ooh, inside a working radio. That's not too good. Okay, what's got my eye is this bank of capacitors here. Okay, we want to go the other way around. And this thing's still scaring me too. Son of a gun. Exposed uh, wire there. I can't bring myself to do it. Okay, we're going to shut the power off here. Give it a moment. It's just too many, too many things to keep your eye on. Unless you put your hand in, you're, you're liable to ground yourself, you know, on the way in, and you're really set up for a big, ugly shock. Big ugly shock. Put back on. Don't know if this is going to make any difference. There's no hum now. somewhere in the, in the scheme. Try and tune something in now. Did I ever get the antenna hooked up? Yes, what am I talking about? We're up around 11 megahertz. Should find something here. Nope. Go up to 13. It's really something. I just need any signal. It's really sad. If it's, if there's just no short wave today. I go way down here. Nine megahertz. There we are. Okay. So, there's quite a strong carrier right here. Oh, there's a voice. Okay. You check the BFO. Switch it on. Adjust the frequency. Now, so the position of this control, I'll be very nervous. I've been very careful all my life to never turn it beyond. But you can see the BFO is way high. Now maybe it's just a tuning thing. Yeah, it's probably just a tuning thing. That's probably where it should be. So you tune the signal on dead on the center and you can adjust the BFO to where this center marker is straight up and the BFO pitch should fall to zero. Like that. That's how it should work. Okay, that should fix something. No BFO before, which meant no uh, no listening to Morse code and stuff like that. Uh, talking about Morse code, how come we couldn't get it? Let's go back to here, and we're going to go and dial in 14 megahertz here. Okay, so I'm going to attach the ground on the antenna. Maybe I'm just not getting enough antenna action here.
I didn't make much difference. Yeah, I don't know. Reception really poor. <laughs> but that's not a concern right now. The fact is, the BFO has started working. It's uh, There's alignment issues with it that we'll eventually get to, bring it into the right frequency. So I've driven out all these problems here. Uh, most of them just kind of evaporated. Made one repair, broken lead, oddly enough. Very odd. Very lucky to have spotted that. Next stage is uh, operate the radio like I just was, measure all the pin voltages and compare against this chart, this chart here. And at that point, I'll kind of know the set is in its proper operating condition, if you like. And from there, we can start looking at alignment, performance, and all that kind of stuff. So thanks a lot for watching. And uh, oh my gosh, it looks like a long video here. See ya.